Hello everyone, and welcome to the 161st episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Coriolanus Snow and the world of The Hunger Games. A brutal and twisted universe lorded over by the sadistic and cruel tyrant who calls himself a president, this series presents us with a dystopian realm unlike any other, one where thousands are left to starve and slave for their oppressors, a world where children are forced to fight one another to the death in sickening sporting events, events that are catered towards punishing the people of this country in perpetuity for their past transgressions against the capital regime. But there's a lot more to Pan Am, The Hunger Games, and President Snow than meets the eye, and in this video, we're going to explore all aspects of this dreaded alternate version of our world, so we might better understand all the evil that infests every nook and cranny of this universe. To do so, we'll be examining the hypothetical origins of Pan Am, the structure of this country and its government, the Hunger Games themselves, and of course, the man responsible for refining the glamorous brutality of this world, President Coriolanus Snow. Now without further ado, let's begin. At the time of the making of this video, the history of Pan Am is largely unknown. However, we can make some pretty solid inferences about what time period this story takes place in by taking into account what we do know of its history, if we consider that the Hunger Games universe is meant to be an alternate version of our own, and by examining some of the objects and technology that are present in this world. At the time the second Pan Am Civil War concludes, we can assume that Pan Am had been around for at least 79 years, as the first Pan Am Civil War supposedly begun around three years prior to the first Hunger Games. That doesn't mean Pan Am is only 79 years old though, as this first civil war was instigated by the first district rebellion. And in order for there to be a rebellion, there needs to be some sort of history of oppression that led up to it. A history that we don't know much about. But we do know that Pan Am was formed after a series of ecological disasters and a global conflict that presumably eradicated all other peoples on Earth, as we're never given any mention of other nations aside from Pan Am. With that in mind, I propose that the conflict in question was an extended World War II, and the ecological disasters could have been brought on by a combination of natural phenomena and nuclear warfare. How I've arrived at this conclusion is by factoring in various objects and technology that we see displayed in the films. Take what we see in the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes as an example. While the technology we see in this film is advanced in many ways, it has that sort of antiquated technology feel to it, which is very reminiscent of tech you'd associate with the 1940s and 1950s. Similarly, in District 12 and Katniss's era, which we can assume has come to a technological and cultural standstill due to the hardships they've suffered in their enslavement to the capital, the clothes we find people wearing here would look right at home in this era of American history. And to provide further proof to this notion, we have the Everdeen's picture of their fallen patriarch, which looks as if it were taken with a camera that one might find in this era, and in the era preceding it. So for the sake of establishing a time frame, let's say World War II did not end in 1945, but dragged on until 1949. In this imagined scenario, not only was this extended world war causing intense turmoil to the various populations of the world, but at some point in this conflict, a series of ecological disasters began plaguing the entire world, which includes what we can assume to be rising sea levels, which submerged nearly all of the world's coastlines, adding further strife to an already miserable situation. Now I'm not too sure that rising sea levels in a world war would have been the sole cause of the world's misery, as there could have been a number of things alongside this event that contributed to it. But for the sake of aiding the possibility of this scenario, let's say that alongside the rising sea levels, there was some sort of worldwide infestation of crop-eating insects, or a virus that affected the majority of crops. Perhaps a prehistoric one that lay dormant in an iceberg that was released following the rise of global temperatures, and this caused much of the world's food production to come to a grinding halt, which then turned this world war against competing powers into a struggle for basic resources, and this created countless internal conflicts and civil wars amongst the various populations of each country. If we take all these things and apply them to the countries of North America, we'll doubtlessly find that they experience collapsed governments and a population that's been decimated by the various disasters they've experienced, which is evident by the relatively small populations of the districts. And from the ashes of this broken world rose a totalitarian power that consolidated its strength in the center of the Rocky Mountains, a geographical fortress placed far away from any treacherous coastlines. However, there is one distinct advantage this new government had over any other world government, nuclear weapons. In our world, the United States finished developing nuclear weapons in July of 1945, and to end World War II, they chose to drop two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki less than a month later. In this universe, let's say that due to the prolonged conflict, the development of the atomic bomb was slightly delayed, but still successful. Due to the ongoing war, there was no immediate need to use the bomb right after its development. But after the world went through disaster after disaster, and this new authoritarian power secured its position, they chose one of the most horrific ways they could have used these bombs. Rather than aiding the world around them, they chose to drop atomic bombs on the remaining population centers across the globe to ensure that no external conflict could ever threaten their power again. Once this bombing had been completed, over the next 
first few years, the remaining people scattered across the globe slowly perished from either radiation sickness, the aforementioned lack of resources, or any number of conflicts that flared up due to the hardship presented to them. And all that remained as the ashes of this terrible period in human history settled was a singular nation, Pan Am. But for the leaders of Pan Am, a return to the governmental structure of old that created so much strife was unthinkable. And so they chose to model their new government after the Roman Empire, consolidating their power in the capital, the new Rome, whilst the provinces languished as vassals to their might and slaves to their will. A country that provided a modicum of safety, shelter, and sustenance for many, so the few might experience luxury, decadence, and debauchery. After establishing this fledgling system, a period of reconstruction ensued that would bolster the power of the capital while leaving the districts they had established to wallow in poverty. And while it's feasible that the first rebellion happened shortly after the creation of Pan Am, I'm going to assume that it took at least a decade, if not a few decades, for real discontent to set in and for District 13 to consolidate its power. So let's say that between 10 and 30 years after the advent of capital rule, the districts, with the help of District 13's military might, staged their rebellion. So if that's the case, that would mean that Pan Am was created roughly between 89 and 109 years prior to the fall of President Snow, which would mean that the year this story takes place would be between 2039 to 2059. Now when you take a look at all the components of this scenario, there seems to be one glaring flaw with it, the tech that the capital has access to. Given the time frame, it seems unlikely that they'd be able to achieve such achievements considering that the world and the human population has been broken. All the body modifications, medical advancements, hovercrafts, and terraformed arenas seem like they'd be quite impossible. We don't know what our own world is going to look like in 2039, let alone 2059. But even this story does take place between these years, their advancements are actually quite feasible. At the time of the making of this video, Video. We're nearing eight decades since the conclusion of World War II, and we haven't developed a lot of the advanced tech we see displayed during Katniss's era. And as we've seen during the time period the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes takes place, some of the highly advanced technology at the Capitol's employ that were shown during her era doesn't quite exist yet. But it is a fair bit more advanced than what we had achieved during the corresponding era in our own universe. Why it's possible that the Capitol was able to develop such highly advanced tech despite the conditions of the world they lorded over is due to the unique position they've put themselves in. With the elimination of all global enemies and a sizable slave labor force available to them, the researchers and inventors tasked with bringing glory to their fledgling nation were provided with an unprecedented access to resources and unburdened time. There were no more threats of war from outside powers, no limitation of resources by those powers, a smaller population consuming less resources, and a workforce that provided everything the capital citizen could ever need while they focused on refining and improving existing technology. Every brilliant mind in the capital was able to point their efforts towards realizing any technological advancements that they set their sights on, without having to worry about any external factors affecting their research or production. Not only that, but the capital wasn't focused on developing new technology for all of humanity, or even the population of their entire country, but solely for the benefit of the capital. And this combination of unlimited labor, resources, time, and efforts focused on only one population center allowed for accelerated innovation. In our world, there are thousands, if not millions of scientists and researchers all across the world endeavoring to solve thousands of problems for billions of people. But in this universe, there are thousands of scientists and researchers working to solve only a handful of problems for perhaps millions of people at most. And so World War II era bombers and passenger planes became hovercrafts. Plastic surgery and modern medicine became futuristic cure-alls for nearly everything. And locomotives became bullet trains capable of transferring people from Virginia to the Rockies in the span of a day. With near limitless resources, time afforded to them by their innovations and the labor of the oppressed, the people of the capital were allowed to flourish in a sickeningly dazzling way. So what does everything we've discussed so far have to do with all the evil present in this universe? Well, other than being a bit of fun to try and figure things out, we can draw further understanding of the core philosophy of the Pan Am government and the idea behind the Hunger Games from what we've just discussed. And from here, we'll gain a better understanding of Pan Am's elite's overall motivation for propping up this dreaded system. I mentioned earlier that Pan Am was modeled after Rome, and to further understand in what ways, we have the following conversation between Plutarch and Katniss in the Mockingjay novel regarding the differences between District 13 and the Capitol. But the significant difference between 13 and the Capitol are the expectations of the populace. 13 was used to hardship, whereas in the Capitol, all they've known is Pan Am et Circenses. What's that? I recognize Pan Am, of course, but the rest is nonsense. It's a saying from thousands of years ago, written in a language called Latin about a place called Rome. He explains, Panem et Circenses translates into bread and circuses. The writer was saying that in return for full bellies and entertainment, his people had given up their political responsibilities and therefore their power. 
Coupled with our imagined scenario, just these few sentences alone are enough to understand what the leaders of Pan Am were thinking when they founded this horrid nation. The Pan Am elite decided that they needn't cater to the masses any longer. They only needed to concern themselves with their own desires. With the breaking of the world, they were now poised to consolidate their power like the kings of old. And indeed, their new society was modeled after that of a kingdom, one where the nobility enjoyed the succulent riches provided to them by the backbreaking labor forced upon their serfs and slaves. For those in the districts, no choice was given in this matter. But for those in the capital, only one ultimatum was offered. Give us everything, and you may live a life of luxury and decadence that has no parallel in human history, and so form this new sinister government and the society that they ruled. One that had some of the trappings of the old to conceal their ill intent, but one that didn't resemble any previous form of republican or democratic government in the slightest, and many people would suffer greatly as a result. But just as they'd eliminated any external threats, they now needed to control any threats within their own borders to keep their power secure, and while oppressing the masses went a long way in accomplishing this feat, the capital would soon learn that crippling them was the only way to ensure their new system survived. The districts already suffered heavily due to their enslavement and the drain on all their resources. The people of the districts lived in a world of constant surveillance, poverty, and hardship, confined to the perimeters of their districts and forbidden from contacting other districts, lest they commingle and start planning another uprising. But once the first rebellion had been crushed and District 13 forced to agree to a ceasefire, a plan to further break the districts was formed, the Hunger Games. As is revealed in the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the Hunger Games were not actually a creation of the higher echelons of the capital government, but of two, but mostly one student, Casca Highbottom, future dean of the Capital Academy, and Crashes Snow, father of Coriolana Snow. When Crashus and Casca were students, they were assigned by their professor, Volumnia Gall, to devise a punishment for one's enemy so extreme that they would never be allowed to forget how they had wronged you. And after Casca offhandedly suggested a bloody sporting event like the Hunger Games, he was coaxed into fleshing out his suggestion after Crashus got him drunk. Thus, a far-fetched idea created by a high school student became a reality after Dr. Gall introduced it to the upper ranks of the capital following the war, a means to eternally punish people who just wanted to be free. So after being disarmed and forced to live as slaves, these people who lacked basic adequate amenities like shelter and running water went from being the abused children of the capital to the shattered violent hordes that needed to be punished for daring to challenge their might more than they already were on a day-to-day -day basis. So every year, on the 4th of July no less, 24 tributes from 12 districts were chosen to fight amongst each other and sacrifice their lives so one amongst them may stand supreme as victor. A living reminder of the power of the capital and the continued punishment these people have not so rightfully earned for their forebearers transgressions. But why? What is the true purpose of these barbaric games? Well, we have two separate passages from the novels to give us some insight. Here's one of Katniss's musings from The Hunger Games, taking the kids from our districts, forcing them to kill one another while we watch. This is the capital's way of reminding us how totally we are at their mercy, how little chance we would stand of surviving another rebellion. Whatever words they use, the real message is clear. Look how we take your children and sacrifice them, and there's nothing you can do. If you lift a finger, we will destroy every last one of you, just as we did in District 13. To make it humiliating as well as torturous, the capital requires us to treat the Hunger Games as a festivity, a sporting event pitting every district against the others. The last tribute alive receives a life of ease back home, and their district will be showered with prizes, largely consisting of food. All year, the capital will show the winning district gifts of grain and oil, and even delicacies like sugar, while the rest of us battle starvation. This ties into something that President Snow remarks in the films, that the only thing stronger than fear is hope. Yes, the Hunger Games is an expression of the capital's absolute power, but the chance they provide at granting the victor in their district with riches they're typically deprived of adds a crucial component to the games that makes it so the rage the people of the districts undoubtedly feel towards the capital is tempered by hope, no matter how small that hope actually is. Oppression without any sort of hope baked into it somewhere is bound to cause rebellious intent to boil over eventually, and the pageantry and pomp of the Hunger Games is quite the impressive, albeit sickening aspect of the games. However, it wasn't always like this. Originally, the game were crude, primitive, and exponentially more barbarous. The arena that the capital used for the first dozen or so games was but an old sporting venue that they'd converted into a thunderdome. The tributes were trucked in from their districts in cattle cars, dumped in cages at the zoo, starved, then thrown into this dilapidated coliseum with an assortment of weapons, and told to fight until one of them remained. In these early stages of the games, there was little incentive for the people of the various districts to watch the games, save for perhaps the loved ones of the tributes. But even then, I doubt a majority of them were too keen on watching their children, friends, siblings, etc., potentially get skewered or bludgeoned to death by another starving child in a filthy, run-down arena. Perhaps if this overall miserable situation had continued, another rebellion may have happened rather quickly. But then along came a man who would secure the macabre power that the capital government held over Panem for more than six decades, Coriolanus Snow. 
Now, the second piece of information that gives us greater insight into the nature of the Hunger Games that I mentioned earlier is given to us through an exchange by Coriolanus and the insidious Dr. Volumnia Gall, the original head game maker and pioneer in mutation experimentation. Did you think about the Hunger Games? Casca asked you what their purpose was, and you gave the stock answer, to punish the districts. Would you change that now? Coriolanus remembered the conversation he'd had with Sejanus as they'd unpacked his duffel. I'd elaborate on it. They're not just to punish the districts. They're part of the eternal war. Each one is its own battle, one that we could hold in the palm of our hand instead of waging a real war that could get out of our control. And they're a reminder of what we did to each other, what we have the potential to do again because of who we are, he continued. And who are we, did you determine? She asked. Creatures who need the capital to survive. Now this exchange not only gives us insight into the nature of the Hunger Games, but the nature of tyrannical regimes in general. Authoritarian states are ever at war with their people, or others who they deem to be enemies, real or manufactured, and it's their paranoid grip on their fragile iron-fisted power that drives them to enact wholesale violence upon their own people. In the case of Pan Am, not only do they oppress their people every second of every day, but they choose to continually break their spirits through these horrific games so they can always be reminded of the massive, seemingly immovable power that rules all aspects of their lives. But what this conversation also accomplishes is conveying to us that Coriolanus Snow completely understands the Hunger Games and what they're meant to be, and because of that understanding, he became the ideal man to perfect and use them to further his own power and the power of his nation. Coriolanus Snow was born into the powerful Snow family, a family that had acquired their wealth by operating a number of factories and military research facilities in District 13. After the first rebellion was crushed and District 13 obliterated, the Snow family lost nearly all of their wealth and what little they had retained, they spent during the Civil War so they could stay alive. Such a rapid loss of wealth and station may have been tenable for this family had it not been for the death of their patriarch, General Crashes Snow, who was shot by a rebel whilst touring a battlefield. Perhaps if General Snow had survived the war, his contributions to the war effort could have secured some new business interests for the Snow family. But because he didn't, the Snows were forced into draining their meager savings in order to stay afloat. And the war years were as miserable for Coriolanus Snow as they were for many others within the capital and elsewhere in the districts. During this time period, Coriolanus had to contend with hunger, frigid living conditions, the terror of bombing raids, and the uncertainty of survival on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And he witnessed many an atrocity being committed by civilians looking to survive including murder, rioting, and even cannibalism, all of which hardened this otherwise privileged boy to the dread realities of the world. Along with these hardships and horrors, Coriolanus had to deal with not just the death of his father, but his mother as well, who had died in childbirth shortly before his father's passing. As far as how their deaths affected Coriolanus, his father was not a man he particularly loved, but one that he had certainly felt protected by him. His death was associated with a fear and a vulnerability that Coriolanus had never been able to shake off. The death of his mother, whom Coriolanus was far more fond of, was a heartbreaking event that left Coriolanus in the wind without any real support from someone who loved and cared for him. And Coriolanus would frequently turn to a compact containing rose-scented makeup that his mother had once owned for comfort and security when he needed it. Now aside from the obvious trauma he was forced to endure during the war, Coriolanus seemed to have had a fairly well-adjusted upbringing. And as far as the formation of the evil of Coriolanus Snow, that's a large part of the problem. When we're introduced to him in the beginning of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, he along with his grandmother and his cousin Tigris live in their family's once prestigious penthouse, a place that has been essentially stripped bare of nearly all its fixtures in order to provide the remaining snows with continued shelter and basic necessities. But rather than humbling Coriolanus, all the hardship that he's had to endure has only given him an intense desire to restore his family to their former glory. When Katniss is pondering the odd nature of capital personalities, she comes to an important conclusion. Who knows who I would be, or what I would talk about, if I'd been raised in the capital? And there lies one of the most gargantuan hurdles that stands before each and every one of us when it comes to understanding and empathizing with others. The bias is ingrained into us by our upbringing. As sad as it may seem, one's own personal, cultural, and familial influences have a far greater effect on us than any other outside forces do. So when Coriolanus and his family were reduced to a state of perpetual poverty, he didn't count himself amongst the fallen and the broken, nor did he identify that his struggles and the misery they brought were shared by others who desperately deserved to have those burdens lifted from their shoulders. He only remembered who his family once was, the power and prestige they held, and what he needed to do to get it back, a sentiment that was spurred on by his grandmother, a woman who embodied every horror thought a capital citizen ever thought, one who considered those in the districts to be subhuman monsters that deserved the submission they had been forced into, submission that she hoped her grandson would one day perfect as president of Pan Am. Not only did he have his grandmother influencing him at home, but at the academy was one Dr. Volumnia Gall, 
a woman I mentioned earlier as the first of the head game makers and a pioneer in mutation research. Coriolanus, who would later go on to employ the extensive use of mutts in warfare and the Hunger Games, earned high marks in genetic studies and came under the influence of Dr. Gall. Dr. Gall was perhaps the greatest proponent of the Hunger Games, a mad woman who thoroughly believed in her cause and the righteousness of it. And she, like Coriolanus's grandmother, thought that the people of the districts were savages, whose place was earned in the social order by their rebellion. And it was the capital standing between their selfish desires for freedom and the total destruction of humanity. And Dr. Gall was hoping to transform Coriolanus into the leader Pan Am needed to continue their very important work. But there was one force in Coriolanus's life that nearly changed him for the better. Lucy Gray Baird, female tribute from District 12 for the Hunger Games, and mentee to Coriolanus Snow. Throughout his tenure as Lucy's mentor, he showed her an unusual amount of kindness for a boy of his station. Kindness that was initially meant to serve as something that would make him stand out amongst the crowd and help lift him and his family out of the situation they'd been forced into. But over time, Coriolanus grew to love this strange and eccentric girl from the provinces, so much so that he endeavored to keep her alive during the games in any way that he could, which subsequently earned him banishment from the capital to serve as a peacekeeper in District 12 for helping a tribute cheat in the games. Much like Coriolanus' experience with poverty following the war, his time as a peacekeeper brought him no greater understanding of the plight of his fellow man, and it only served to harden him against them. To his credit though, much like with Lucy Gray, it was never a cut and dry affair with Coriolanus and his feelings towards the peoples of the districts. Initially, he struggled with some of the treatment they received, and he was ever protective of Lucy Gray whilst he was there, entering into a relationship with her that was filled with love and affection that nearly saw him running away with her after he murdered two people to protect her, fearing the repercussions once the peacekeepers traced the murder weapon back to him. But despite all he'd been through up to this point, Coriolanus was unable to shirk off his desire to restore his family to glory, and when faced with the possibility of returning to the capital by destroying his murder weapon or living a wild existence with Lucy Gray. He chose to return following Lucy Gray's decision to run from him when he discovered the possibility of returning to the capital. And as a parting gift, he was bitten by a non-poisonous snake that would pretend his rise to power as the treacherous snake-like leader of Pan Am. His time spent in District 12 and Lucy Gray's betrayal confirmed everything to Coriolanus that his grandmother and Dr. Gall had been trying to instill within him. That the district folk were lawless, savage, and treacherous, and tragically, that love was something to be mistrusted and hated. Upon his return to the capital, Coriolanus realized that it was his duty to contribute to the glorious system of Pan Am at all costs, to serve as a bulwark against the forces that sought to not just destroy the capital and its system, but humanity itself. Here's Coriolanus' own thoughts on the matter that we receive towards the end of the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Sometimes he would remember a moment of sweetness and almost wish things had ended differently, but it would never have worked out between them. Even if he'd stayed, they were simply too different, and he didn't like love, the way it made him feel stupid and vulnerable. If he ever married, he'd choose someone incapable of swaying his heart, someone he hated even, so they could never manipulate him the way Lucy Gray had, never make him feel jealous or weak. Livia Cardew would be perfect. He imagined the two of them, the president and his first lady, presiding over the Hunger Games a few years from now. He'd continue the games, of course, when he ruled Pan Am. People would call him a tyrant, iron-fisted, and cruel, but at least he would ensure survival for survival's sake, giving them a chance to evolve. What else could humanity hope for? Really, it should thank him. And indeed, after becoming an influential game maker and making revolutionary changes to the games, like the implementation of betting, the Victor's Village, varied arenas, mandatory viewings, and the district-wide prizes the Victor's people received, Coriolanus Snow clawed his way to the top of the Pan Am pecking order, a rise that is explained to us by Finnick O'Dare. And now, on to our good president Coriolanus Snow, such a young man when he rose to power, such a clever one to keep it. How, you must ask yourself, did he do it? One word, that's all you really need to know. Poison. Finnick goes back to Snow's political ascension, which I know nothing of, and works his way up to the present, pointing out case after case of the mysterious deaths of Snow's adversaries, or, even worse, his allies who had the potential to become threats. People dropping dead at a feast, or slowly, inexplicably declining into shadows over a period of months, blamed on bad shellfish, or an overlooked weakness in the aorta, Snow drinking from the poison cup himself to deflect suspicion. But antidotes don't always work. They say that's why he wears the roses that reek of perfume. They say it's to cover the scent of blood from the mouth sores that will never heal. They say, they say, they say, Snow has a list, and no one knows who will be next. Murder, torture, subterfuge, espionage, manipulation, coercion, flattery, every sinister trait, skill, or method you can possibly imagine, and President Snow undoubtedly employed it during his rise to power. By the time Katniss Everdeen is chosen to be a tribute in the 75th Hunger Games, Pan Am had become everything its founders had dreamt it would be. It was a veritable haven of decadence, luxury, excess, and debauchery, 
all overseen by the man who took the rose as his symbol, the scent of which brought him comfort in his youth, the scent that he uses to hide the brutality of himself and the world he oversees, and a flower that, while beautiful on the outside, holds a treacherous undercarriage, just like his precious capital. As far as who Coriolanus is as a person, when he was younger, he was considered austere, reserved, respectful, unemotional, and ambitious, and in adulthood, he was much the same person, only now after experiencing the hardship of his beginnings and immersing himself in all manner of evil to acquire and maintain his position, he's become merciless, ruthlessly pragmatic, brutal, cruel, and wholly without empathy, a man who is best described as the living manifestation of Pan Am. However effective this dreaded man was as its leader though, he as well as Pan Am as a whole had one fatal flaw that ensured that they would be destroyed eventually. Arrogance. When Katniss has her first private conversation with President Snow at her house, he offers her the following courtesy right away. I think we'll make this whole situation a lot simpler by agreeing not to lie to each other. Now that might not seem like too nefarious a statement on the surface. In fact, it seems rather nice of Snow to offer Katniss the truth, but he's only offering to establish common truthful ground with her because he is so absolutely sure of his power that he feels that it doesn't matter whether or not he lies to her, as she can't really do anything to him, even if he tells her the truth. Throughout the entirety of their struggle against one another, Snow constantly underestimates Katniss and the rebels that were inspired by her defiance in the games, believing that no matter what they do, he can control the situation, as Snow always does. As we know though, Snow's efforts ultimately fail, but not before he had entire populations firebombed, bombs dropped on hospitals, and children used as human shields to prevent his own death. A man who, as he puts it, only takes life for very specific reasons, but those reasons are some of the darkest you can imagine. What his defeat inevitably came down to was his hyperfixation on the Mockingjay, a figure that he had coveted when he was younger as Lucy Gray Baird, who has perhaps come back to haunt him as the young Katniss Everdeen, and of course, his arrogance, as believing that you are so powerful that you can wantonly flaunt your power in front of your enemies without repercussion is a surefire way to ensure your eventual destruction. It's interesting to note how men like Snow and the regimes they prop up operate with such a volatile mixture of paranoia and arrogance. Men like Snow will do any horrid thing to stamp out any threats to their power, but when it comes to recognizing the capabilities of those threats, they seem to falter. For as tight as the iron grip of a dictator is, they often cannot see the small threats that slip steadily through their fingers until they coalesce into a power greater than their own. To Snow's credit, at least he was able to look inward at his own faults and realize where he had gone wrong before he met his end, which is more than we can say for many a person who has been in his position. Now as much as Snow's rise to power was for personal power, wealth, and glory, it was also geared towards an honest attempt at preserving the system that his progenitors had created. Coriolanus Snow believed in Pan Am, and as much as he was manipulated into becoming its leader by his grandmother and Dr. Gall, it was his experiences growing up under a system that afforded his family wealth, prestige, and honor that drove him to viewing the tyranny of Pan Am as the last line of defense against the legions of ignorant heathens that sought to destroy all the glory they had wrought and even humanity itself. Because for Coriolanus and the elites, the status quo was the only thing standing between civilization and anarchy. However, such a system is brittle, as we've learned through the rebellion that eventually crushed it. But that fragility is viewed much differently by President Snow and the capital elites. When Coriolanus confirmed to Katniss that the system was fragile during the conversation at their house, but not in the way that she thought, he meant that it was fragile because it was surrounded by unwashed hordes waiting to collapse the shining beacon of civilization that was the capital. It was not capital governance, but the threats that it was besieged by upon all sides that it was constantly at war with. Threats that could not comprehend what Coriolanus Snow and the capital elites believed was perfection given governmental form. Again, we're given a show of these people's arrogance, believing that they were the anointed few destined to guide humanity through the treachery that is human existence. And for that, and all the crimes they committed in service to their cause, they deserve the utmost condemnation. Snow was the hero of Pan Am, the champion of all its ideals and its greatest representative. He was everything that his family and nation needed him to be, and while he is assuredly a villain to every life outside the capital and quite the number of lives within it, he was exactly what this horrid nation looked to inspire, and for that reason, Snow is both a hero and a villain. But Pan Am and its foundations are villainous by nature, and if he is the hero of the villains, well there isn't too much merit in labeling him as one, even if it is technically true. But even amongst causes heroic, you'll find villainous figures, and one such person is Snow's presidential counterpart, President Coyne. Coyne is much like President Snow personality-wise, and I imagine that she even had a similar, or even identical upbringing to him. We don't know this for certain, but it stands to reason that the first rebellion was not aided by District 13 because of some noble desire to unite the oppressed people of Pan Am, but because the Coyne family, or its predecessors, desired to usurp the power of the capital and claim it as their own. 
Just as Snow was bolstering his police state to keep the peoples of the district subdued, the Coin family was preparing a disciplined military force to finish what their forebears had started, claiming the power of the capital for themselves. Why I think this might be the case is because of Coin's shady activities, namely her attempts at murdering Katniss because she saw her as a threat to her power, ordering the bombing of the children placed outside Snow's mansion, proclaiming herself as interim president, and her willingness to host another Hunger Games to punish the capital's elites, all of which point to her motivations being less than admirable. I believe it's not too far-fetched to assume that President Coin, though she was helping the oppressed shirk off the oppressors, was not doing so for their benefit. Rather than viewing Pan Am as an oppressive state that needed to be brought down, she saw it as a club that her family was denied access to, and she didn't just want back in, she wanted to lead it. And this just goes to show that it's probably a good idea to be fully aware of who you're allowing to lead you into battle, as no matter what sort of rose-tinted sheen the person championing your cause might appear to have, there can always be a thicket of thorns lying deep within their soul. In regard to the unfortunate reality that there are selfish and destructive individuals out for their own gain, who are willing to harm countless innocents on any side of a cause, we have the following musing from Katniss on all that she's witnessed and experienced. I think that PETA was onto something about us destroying one another and letting some decent species take over, because something is significantly wrong with a creature that sacrifices its children's lives to settle its differences. You can spin it any way you like. Snow thought the Hunger Games were an efficient means of control. Coin thought the parachutes would expedite the war, but in the end, who does it benefit? No one. The truth is, it benefits no one to live in a world where these things happen. War and violence are indeed a tragedy of the human condition that no one really benefits from. Tragedies that countless people are forced to suffer through every day. However, that doesn't mean we need to give up on humanity. Despite all the misery the people of this universe have been put through, the outlook for Pan Am at the end of this series seems to be tentatively promising. Early on in the Mockingjay novel, we're given the following exchange between some of the rebels and the high command of District 13. If we win, who would be in charge of the government? Gale asks. Everyone, Plutarch tells him. We're going to form a republic where the people of each district and the capital can elect their own representatives to be their voice in a centralized government. Don't look so suspicious. It's worked before. In books, Hamish mutters. In history books, says Plutarch. And if our ancestors could do it, then we can too. Towards the end of the novel, after the war has been won, Katniss and Plutarch have the following conversation, when Katniss asks him if he's preparing for another war. Oh, not now. Now we're in that sweet period where everyone agrees that our recent horrors should never be repeated. But collective thinking is usually short-lived. We're fickle, stupid beings, with poor memories, and a great gift for self-destruction. Although who knows, maybe this will be it, Katniss. What? I ask. The time it sticks. Maybe we are witnessing the evolution of the human race think about that. True enough accusations, but hopeful sentiment that we can all look to for some solace. There is always the opportunity for humanity to emerge from a period marked by evil and reinvent our society into one that will never repeat the mistakes of our past. Once something has been broken, it's a difficult road to repair it. And as Katniss remarked during a conversation with Finnick and Mockingjay, it takes ten times as long to put yourself back together as it does to fall apart. However, I left amusing Katniss offered out of the exchange with the High Command we went over a moment ago that says a lot about the possibilities of their new republic correcting the errors of their past. Frankly, our ancestors don't seem much to brag about. I mean, look at the state they left us in, with the wars and the broken planet. They didn't care about what would happen to the people who came after them. Heartbreaking, but true. We're all so caught up in our own immediate wants and needs that we seldom pause to think what our actions might cause to occur later down the line. And as a species, our long-term planning has often left much to be desired. None of us are seers, and we can't be expected to monitor every single thing we do because of what could be. But the world would be a much better place if we all took a moment every now and then to think about what we're doing and how it might affect others and those who will come after us. For as surely as we're capable of ushering in an age of prosperity and peace, we're always in danger of slipping back into an age of darkness and evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on this story and all the evil in it? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.